As some of you might know, and remember this is a sermon series we're doing, four parts on the Holy Spirit, and today we're in our second part, and we'll be reviewing that briefly for us in a few moments. But before I do that, let me read the central passage that I want to look at with you, and then we can look together at some of the passages. From the 14th chapter according to St. John, and the beginning with the 15th verse. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Let me read that passage again. And that passage. You know him, for he dwells with you and be in you. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, sometimes we sort of read your word and don't quite understand what it has to do with us or how it will express itself in our lives. And we ask that you make it crystal clear to us today that you want us to know that the strength that is available from the Spirit is the strength that is available to us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much and caring for us. In your name we pray. Last week we looked at the first part of the four-part service, and what we did is we looked for the purpose of the of the Holy Spirit. What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? Why have him around? I mean, you can barely see the guy, if ever. He makes himself known in some strange churches doing strange things. Something that we certainly as good Lutherans would not participate in. So what is it about the Holy Spirit that should draw our attention? Well, the first thing that should draw our attention is that there's a purpose for the Holy Spirit that each one of us can benefit from. Well, what's that purpose? Remember, we took a look at the Lutheran doctrine, as I'll abbreviate it, Simeon Justus et Peccato. We are sinners, Peccato, and justified at the same time. In other words, there's no time when you and I can say, I don't have any sin. The reality is that our lives are filled with sin and stained to a point where some people will not even recognize us. And others, as my mother used to say, if you want the Holy Spirit, he's, you're going to have to use a lot of makeup if you want to convince him that he should come to you. My mother had all sorts of uh, theological statements that I had to go to seminary to understand. And, uh, but in any case, the purpose can be understood because there are two aspects to this. The first aspect is sin. The second aspect is justification. And in the next few, in the next, there we go. I always want to room. Okay. In the next few weeks, we're going to take a closer look at justification, sanctification. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and so on. But what does this have to do with the purpose? Well, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to show us our sin. I had a, uh, not a class, well, he was a classmate, but he was a kid who lived downstairs. And uh, he would often say to me, and, and his mother would say to me as well, she would say, look at your hands. Your hands are square. They're, the hands are the uh, brick layer. Whereas my son, look at his hands, the hands of the pianist. But he got arrested for standing naked in the window, and I didn't have to worry about that anymore. But uh, in any case, we can sometimes try to convince ourselves that we don't really have any sin, that we have Jesus in our hearts, and we don't really have any sin. But the Holy Spirit confronts us, confronts us, he convicts us, he challenges us, etc., etc., to recognize and admit the sin that is within us and within our community and within our families. The second part is that not only does the Holy Spirit 
demonstrate and show us our sin, but he also shows us that we have a Savior. And that we can rest assured because of what he has done. Remember we took a look at the whole notion of a Savior, that Jesus Christ has what? He has died for us and in that process took upon himself all of our sin and at the same time was willing to give us the righteousness that was his so that we could live by his righteousness, not by our own. And good movements will take a look at that more closely in a few weeks. Now, if this is the purpose, in other words, the purpose is for the Holy Spirit to confront us and say, Mark, you don't know which Mark I'm referring to, so it could be both. Mark, have you sinned recently? And if your answer is no, you better get back to the Bible, or you better get back to the knees. Because the reality is that we all need a Savior. We need to be confronted about our sin. But there's more. We were going to talk a little bit about the person, and we can still do that, but I felt that it was too much information, too much overload, so that I'm skipping the person of the Holy Spirit, except to say this, that the Holy Spirit is not a force. It's not Star Wars. It's not the force be with you. When we say the Holy Spirit be with you, and when Paul writes about that, and when Jesus talks about it, he's not talking about a Star Wars kind of God or force. But the Holy Spirit is a person. He was involved in the creation. Genesis 1-2. Immediately he talks about the presence of the Holy Spirit hovering over the seas and hovering over the land. And we can go on and on in Scripture. But what we look at last week is that the most important aspect that is addressed in John is that he is our helper. We cannot do it ourselves. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. We need God. And if you think that you don't, again, come and see me. I'd like to follow what you do in order to come up with the same conclusion. So we have a helper. We have a creator. And we have a savior, Jesus, who is made real to us through the Holy Spirit. Now, we have a helper, a creator, and we have power. under circumstances that we don't need to get into very much, but there's a passage that was given to me from Timothy that basically says that I have not given you the spirit of timidity, but I've given you the spirit of love, power, and self-control. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives us power. He shares His power with each one of us. And you and I might not stick around long enough to avail ourselves of that power, but the reality is that He does, in fact, give us power by becoming a spirit within us. So we not only have a helper, we have a helper who is powerful. Let me read to you just a small part of this passage, and we can talk about it with him. <coughs> That we just read a few moments ago from the 14th chapter, beginning with the 15th verse. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. Is that clear? He will dwell with you. What a surprise, what a joy, what an expectation. Here we have the Holy Spirit who is willing to direct us, he's willing to guide us, he's willing to inspire us, he's willing to strengthen us, he's willing to be there for us because he wants to be in us so that he can grow us for his kingdom. And that's what this passage is saying. The other passages in Corinthians, for instance, in the sixth chapter of Corinthians, what does it say? Our body is the Lord, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit dwells with us. And not only individually, but in the third chapter of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing about the Holy Spirit that is available 
to the congregation. In other words, the whole congregation can be filled with the Spirit. And so it's important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit will be in us and will lead us, guide us, direct us, show us, and show us how to glorify God. Let me illustrate this. And at this point, I need to have some more help than I usually. Um, would all of the young people who normally come for children's sermon please come forward?
to Jesus to follow him every which way. And that's what I mean, every which way. God wants us to follow him completely from A to Z. In other words, he wants us to ask the question, every day of our lives, how is the activity that I'm involved in today, whether it's work, whether it is uh, selling something, whether it is farming, whether it is working for timber. I know I'm going to run out of examples of it. But all of those, all of those are examples where God wants to be glorified, which means that he wants you to use those talents and gifts and power that God has given you. All of them. All of them. Is that right? Yeah. The Holy Spirit wants to be inside of you so that you can work his love for you. If you, you know, does that make sense to you? Good. Carter is signing up. Now, if you could only get your parents, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know what? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways in which you use your power to strengthen us, to make it possible for us to serve you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.